Welcome to the Law School Toolbox podcast. Today, we're talking about a super fun topic, self-sabotage in law school. Your Law School Toolbox hosts are Allison Monahan, that's me, and Lee Burgess. We're here to demystify the law school and early legal career experience so that you'll be the best law student and lawyer you can be. Together, we're the co-creators of the Law School Toolbox, the Bar Exam Toolbox, and the Catapult Career Conference. And I also run the Girl's Guide to Law School. If you enjoy the show, please leave a review on iTunes. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to us. You can always reach us via the contact forum on lawschooltoolbox.com, and we'd love to hear from you. With that, let's get started. Welcome back to the Law School Toolbox podcast. Today, we are talking about something almost everyone has to figure out, how to create accountability for yourself, along with making sure you aren't engaging in self-sabotaging behavior. And with that, let's get started. So Allison, why is this such an important topic uh, to talk about? Well, because I would say almost every person that I talk to who's struggling in law school, part of what they're struggling with is how to stay accountable, how to manage their time, and how to get everything done. And I think part of the reason for that is just that law school is so self-directed in terms of you're only really tested once, typically at the end of the semester, and you've got a lot, you've got to get, you know, got a lot to do on an ongoing basis. It's just a lot of stuff. And I think a lot of people don't necessarily have the skills to stay accountable and to figure out how to, you know, do this on a daily basis, but also how to do the bigger picture stuff that we've talked about, about deep thinking, practice exams, things like that. You know, it's really different. It's just a much more, it's a much less structured environment than what a lot of people are really used to. And I think that can cause some problems before people develop the skills they need to stay accountable. And I think it's just different than undergrad. I mean, typically, if you went to undergrad full time, you might have been living in the dorms. You didn't have a lot of family responsibilities. You maybe had a part time job. You could survive on a lot less sleep maybe survive even better hungover when <laughs> you were younger. I mean, it's just a totally different ball game. Your ability to procrastinate when you're, you know, 18 to 21 or 22 can be a lot different um, than your abilities when life becomes more complicated and the workload becomes much more intense. I mean, I remember thinking in undergrad that there were times when I was incredibly busy, and that's true. But I think, generally speaking, my incredibly busy times in law school were busier. Yeah, and I think... As an undergrad, the only time you might have this sort of really even remotely equivalent to the sort of free form work that you'll do in law school is something like an honors thesis, Mm -hmm. you know, there and it's like this year long project. But even then, you know, you're probably having regular meetings with an advisor who's helping you do stuff and you're telling you what to look for and making sure that you're doing your research and making sure that you're writing and nobody's, you know, nobody's going to do that for you in law school, typically. No, I will say writing my honors thesis is when I got a little cuckoo crazy when I was in, <laughs> in college. Yeah, but I mean, yeah, I think that's good training for people to do something like law school because it is this more self-directed activity. Whereas in most undergraduate classes, it's like, oh, you have a quiz this day and you have this assignment to turn in. And so you can't really like fall behind that far mm-hmm. or it's going to catch up with you pretty quickly. Whereas here... Sure, maybe you're going to class, you're doing most of the reading, but that's kind of all you have to do for someone not to yell at you. (laughs) Right. And even then, it's like, you know, if you miss doing the reading for a few days, as long as you don't get called on, there really aren't any repercussions. Well, I mean, maybe immediate 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 repercussions. Immediate repercussions, (laughs) exactly. There's no immediate repercussion. No one's going to come and say, like, you have to get back on track. You know, you're not doing your work, blah, blah, blah. No one's going to do that. It's true. And I think that without that feedback loop throughout the semester of having a lot of assignments and having people check in with you, um, you know, I think law professors, too, believe that everyone's an adult and kind of has to take care of themselves. And I think that's a true statement. But they're not going to be worried about what you're doing. That's not really their job. No, and you know, when we talk to people who are interested in tutoring, this is one of the this is one of those like light bulb moments when they go, Oh my gosh, like someone will actually like assign me something to do and they'll follow up with me if I don't do it. (laughs) I'm like, Yeah, that's kind of what you're paying them for. Right. And it's like, oh, wow, that's really different. And it is really different. I'm not saying everybody has to run out and get a law school tutor. You can if you want to, but I think you've got to figure out ways to keep yourself accountable. Mm -hmm. And part of that is a lot of the work is just not that fun. Mm -hmm. You know, it can be kind of tedious. It can be sort of boring. And I think, 
you know, your mindset in terms of how you think about the work is sort of one of those ways that you can make it easier for yourself. So, you know, if every single time you open your books, you're thinking, oh, God, this is going to be such a nightmare. Like, it's so boring. I'm not going to understand it. It's going to take forever. You know, that's going to kind of bring you down. I think whereas, that's true. You know, whereas if you try to approach it like, oh, this is another piece of the puzzle. This is what we're learning about. Let me figure out some questions that might get answered here. You know, that's going to make it more interesting and more engaging. And so stuff like that, in term, I mean, that doesn't help you get it done necessarily. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you still have to sit down and do it. Yeah, But I think having a more like inquisitive type of mindset for this work can make things more interesting. And if you really, really cannot stand everything about law school, maybe it's time to also take a moment. And yeah, I mean, if you find that like every single day, every time you take out your books, you're just like, oh, God, there's nothing I want to be doing less in the world than this. Every time you go to class, you're like bored to tears. You hate it. You're like, oh, I just hate everything about it. It's like, they just quit. Yeah. <laughs> like, you don't have to be there. Yeah. In fact, we got an email from a student recently who just quit and was like, I went through my first couple of weeks of law school and it's clearly not for me. Yeah. They're like, I'm taking another path. We're like, good luck with that. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't think badly of him. I'm like, good for him. Mm -hmm. You know, good for this person for like going there and admitting that this is just not what I want to be doing. Yeah. I mean. There are lots of people who dropped out of law school and are perfectly fine. Yeah. Fine. So, yeah, like, think about uh, Carly Farina. I think dropped out of after one semester of law school, went to business school instead. Yeah, did okay for herself. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, I think it is just important to be checking in with yourself if you're truly miserable. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's like a difference between this is like I'm not. This is not the right place for me. Mm -hmm. Versus like I'm perfectly fine with like doing this. I want to do it. You know, no one's forcing me, but I'm just having trouble like getting the work done. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, what are some ways that people can start to create some sort of accountability for themselves? I mean, something we've talked about on podcasts before is the importance of creating not just a study schedule, but really a life schedule that you can stick to. So blocks of time to study, blocks of time to get exercise, blocks of time to, you know, cook food, blocks of time to see friends and family, things like that. Yeah, I mean, this all sounds really boring if you're like, I have to schedule a time to go to yoga. But the reality is, you know, you're going to be much more likely to go to yoga or much more likely to go out with your friends if you do schedule it in advance. Mm -hmm. That's just the reality. You know, time tends to get away from all of us if we don't actually pay attention. For sure. And I think the other thing that can be a benefit of scheduling some of this time is it's guilt-free time. I mean, if you have scheduled in enough time to get all your work done, you're getting all your work done, then you should go spend time with your significant other or your friends or your dog or whoever that makes you happy because you can't. I mean, I think that's what's one of the mistakes law students make is they are so guilt ridden about not doing work when they're not doing work that they don't get any R&R &R because they're just worried about work the whole time. Yeah, I talked to somebody the other day who's like, well, I decided I was going to leave my study group when someone in it said to me, well, if you're sleeping, you're doing law school the wrong way. Wow. And she's like, I just didn't really think that sounded right. Does that sound right to you? I'm like, you know, that was a good choice to leave that study group. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Like, you can't do a semester at law school and do well without sleep. Yeah. That's just stupid. That's pretty ridiculous. <laughs> you yeah. know, like, I don't know, like, no, that's just stupid. Like, that's not correct. Please go to sleep, you know? Yeah. I no, Yeah. No, and that's the kind of crazy stuff you'll hear from other people in law school. So it's <laughs> important to constantly be checking in with yourself and saying, like, maybe these are not the people that I should be creating accountability <laughs> systems yeah, with. Yeah, and this was somebody who had a lot of other responsibilities. And she's like, you know, I try to schedule my time. Is it okay that, like, I spend a little bit of time with my kid? I'm like, yeah, it's okay that you spend time with your kid. Like, you're mm -hmm. allowed to do that. Yeah. And I think some of this is about making choices. I mean, if you have nothing else to do, you could find study all the time. I don't care. Mm -hmm. But if there's anything else you'd like to do, you need to prioritize that because it's perfectly fine to do other things. And it probably makes you a better person and a better law student. I mean, some of the people who did the best in my class were Mormons who took one entire weekend day off every weekend for religious reasons. Mm -hmm. And they still managed to be on the law review. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like... That, like, 12-hour period that they were not studying did them no harm and, in fact, probably did them good. 
I think that's true. I mean, when we talk to people at the bar exam, which is a more intensive studying experience than most people do in law school, that's one of the things that we always highly recommend is you have to take time off. Like you absolutely have to because burnout is worse than like not studying (laughs) because unproductive study time is terrible. And I think the more disciplined you can be to make the most of the hours you put in, you'll be fine. Like you can take that time off. If you want that time off, you can take that time off. Yeah, and I think it's, I mean, the hard part about accountability is, is about finding this balance. Like, mm-hmm. yes, you have a lot of stuff to do. You need to be responsible about getting it done. But that does not mean that you need to be working 18 hours a day every single day. You cannot do that. No one could do that. No. You're not a robot. Yeah. So it's really this question of, okay, you know, you've got to sit down, say, at the beginning of every month and kind of plan out your schedule for the month. And then you do that every week. And then you do that to a certain extent every night you know, for the next day so that you're constantly have this sort of iterative process of like, okay, what do I need to get done? I mean, maybe you're triaging on things like this is the most important. And then again, there's this distinction between important and urgent. Right. So what might be most important for your grades is actually these deep thinking tasks. So things like, you know, really thinking about the law, like making study aids, making an outline, making a flow chart. These are going to be critically important, but they're not urgent. Yeah. What's urgent is, oh, my God, I have a meeting for this club or I have a legal writing assignment due or I have a class that I know I'm going to be on call or even just your reading could be feel urgent. Right. And it's easy to do those things that are urgent and then get to the end and realize you don't have any outlines. You haven't even looked at a practice test. You have no idea what you're being tested on. And then you're in a mad panic like a week before your exams, which is not a good place to be. No, it's not. And I think keeping your eye on the end game is one of the best ways to prevent yourself from getting into that onto that hamster wheel that we hear from students all the time, which is all I can do is prepare for class. I don't have any time. You know, all I can do is do my legal writing assignment. All I can do, all I can do. And it just never, um, you never get off that hamster wheel. And then all of a sudden, you know, exams are there. So, well, and I think, I mean, if we go back to the self-sabotage aspect of this, sometimes people are so afraid of what's coming yeah, that they just can't make themselves deal with it. That's true. And so if you're so terrified about, oh, this exam is, oh my God, I just don't know. But that you never even look at an exam mm-hmm. to see, like look at a practice exam to see what it's actually like then you're basically self-sabotaging because you're so afraid of looking at it that you don't want to deal with it. And then you get to the end and you haven't dealt with it. And then your self-fulfilling prophecy of you're going to do badly comes true because you didn't study properly. Yeah. (laughs) Like this is to be avoided. Absolutely. (laughs) Because part of the thing is like, if we're talking about a fierce situation, what can dissipate that fear is familiarity. Mm -hmm. You know, if you've never seen a law school exam before you walk into one, of course it's terrifying. Mm -hmm. But by the time you've done 10 questions on negligence, it's like, oh, poof, I got that. Yeah. Yeah, I think that that's very true. And that for me was always something that was comforting in an exam is, you know, always to sit down and have my exam plan set up so I knew that no matter how crazy the question was, I kind of knew what the first thing I was going to do and the second thing I was going to do. And that's comforting. And you can only create those systems and plans through practice. And in order to do practice, you have to have done outlining and and set aside time to do those, uh, those activities. And if you hide from the practice, which is something that will probably make you feel uncomfortable, then That is a self-sabotaging behavior. Yeah. And so I think, you know, if people are listening to this and they're like, oh, but I don't have any idea how to... And the problem is a lot of people actually just don't have the skill set for Mm -hmm. organizing their life. I mean, particularly if you've never worked Mm -hmm. and somebody's always been there telling you what to do, you know, you might actually like literally have no idea how to make a study schedule. So Mm -hmm. we will tell you right now. Um, Yeah. (laughs) Basically, get out a paper calendar. Highly recommend paper. You can transfer it later to your Google Calendar or whatever, but I think it helps people think on paper. Get out some pencils, colored paper, you know, colored pencils, markers, whatever. And actually sit down and block out like, oh, okay, every Saturday from noon until 4 p.m. or whatever, I'm going to do some sort of deep thinking task. And then you actually put that on your calendar. Mm Mm-hmm. And in this case, you can switch it to Google Calendar because then you just make a recurring appointment. Fine. Make a recurring appointment with yourself 
on Saturday at noon for four hours of deep thinking work. And like right now, you don't even have to know what that means. Right. Just trust us. You're going to need some time. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> you know, and you put in all of your other stuff, like your classes, blah, blah, blah. And then you're like, well, what do I need to do? Like, what do I do in law school on a regular basis? Well, first thing, probably you're going to need to do some reading, right? Yeah. And so your goal is to think about, well, how long is that typically going to take me? I would say about 10 pages per hour mm -hmm. if you're starting out is a good place to start. Yeah. But you want to kind of pay attention to, am I faster than that? Am I slower than that? Are there certain classes I'm faster or slower? Because you really want to get this right. You know, you don't want to pretend that you're going to do your entire reading for the week in two hours because that's not going to happen. You know, so then you're like, okay, I'm going to need like a total of, say, 20 hours of reading time a week. Well, then it's time to look at your schedule. Where are you going to put that? Yeah. You know, literally, are you going to read from seven until nine in the morning? Or are you going to read from seven until nine at night? I don't care. Right. Do whatever makes sense. You know, do whatever is where you're the freshest. Yep. But you actually literally need to block that time out. And you might find it, you might look at your calendar and be like, gosh, this is really like not going to fit during the week. Probably not. You're probably going to have to do some reading on the weekends. Mm -hmm. But yeah. these, like, you have to go through this process of actually creating this schedule and then seeing if it's working. You can't, I mean, all of your good attentions aside, you can, basically can't just be like, oh, I'll do my reading during the week. Yeah. That's not, that's not a schedule. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, it's interesting when I was um, at orientation for undergrad, I remember the president of my college saying that if every undergrad student put 40 hours of work into school each week, everyone would be incredibly successful and get everything in, like done during the week. And I remember sitting there going, well, I'm sure I'm going to study more than 40 hours a week. And I'll bet if I could go back and visit 18-year-old Lee and clocked how much time I actually spent <laughs> studying and doing work in those early days, um, I, don't, I don't think it was 40 hours. I mean, there were <laughs> probably like periods of time around exams or when I was working on a big paper that the time, you know, got really intense. But there was a lot of time, you know, at the dorms, hanging out and whatever, whatever. Oh, there's nothing wrong with that. No, that's and that's part of the experience. But I think that there's this idea that we just assume that we're doing so much. Um, and if you had asked my 18 year old self, I would have told you for sure that I was studying, you know, as much as I needed to, if not more, when probably if I tracked my time, I wasn't. And so that's why we oftentimes encourage students in law school who are saying they don't have enough time to get things done is to track their time and find out where the time is going so you can make these study schedules and then own them. You know, there are free time tracking softwares out there. Toggle is one of them. Um, but you can just Google, there are a lot of different options where you can just enter how you spend your time, find out where your hours are going and tell yourself, you know, I can't spend three hours in the library not getting anything done. Yeah. And a lot of the advantages, I mean, the advantage of these time tracking software is that they literally have timers like in your browser. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you pretend that you're going to the library to read for three hours and you stop to do something else in your browser, like why not turn the timer off? Yeah. <laughs> you know, and then turn it back on when you start working again. Because you'll find that that three hour period you were supposedly doing your focused reading was actually more like an hour by the time you had a bunch of distractions. You, you know, were chatting with a friend a little bit about some other, you know, some club issue that you're trying to organize a speaker for. And then you were also, oh, you had to check in on like Instagram and Facebook for a little while just to see how everybody was doing. And oh, then your mom called. You know, you're going to find out you're not actually working. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's amazing. I mean, I swear you might be shocked, shocked where the hours are going. Yeah, absolutely. And I think part of this is procrastination. And that's another, you know, huge self-sabotage thing. Um, and yeah, I think for the pro procrastination, A, you've got to notice that you're doing it. And then B, you've got to figure out what's actually going on here. Yeah. You know, like, why are you not doing this work? Do you just not feel like it? You know, are you trying to do your reading, for example, when you're too tired and it's just not the right time for you to be doing your reading? I mean, everybody has different times during the day when they're fresh. Mm -hmm. And ideally, that's the time where you want to be doing these cognitively demanding tasks like reading cases, which is not an easy thing to do. No. And you can't be yawning and falling asleep while you're doing it. Well, you can, but it's just going to waste time. <laughs> right. I mean, you know, what I say to people, like, look, if you're in a situation where you're so tired, 
that you're reading the same page over and over and it's not sinking in, just stop. Mm -hmm. Go to bed. Yeah. Like, you know, you're going to be better off going to sleep, getting up in the morning and doing your reading in the morning than you are if you're so tired at night. I mean, for me, I was a night person. So that was the time it was best for me to do the reading. And I just did it after dinner for like three hours every night. Mm -hmm. But again, like a lot of people, I mean, almost everyone I would say is going to have to do a lot of their reading for one of the days of the weekend. Yeah, I think that's true. Did you ever have any accountability partners? Did you and your friends ever set up any accountability systems? I guess sometimes, I mean, I would like meet someone at the library, for example, if we were like, you know, had something we had to do. Or I guess when I was on the law review, actually, like after I'd done whatever assignment I had as a 2L, I'd often like stay because mm-hmm. other, pe- other people were doing work. And so, you know, you kind of felt like, oh, I'm not so alone if we're all sitting in the same room doing right. our work together. Yeah, I had a friend that sometimes we would like check in with each other on how projects were going. We were in some like research and writing classes together, you know, just to kind of Mm -hmm. be able to say like, have you been doing it or, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, I always, I'm, I don't have a hard time making myself study. I'm one of those people who has to have like somebody to meet me to go for a run in the morning or, you know, that kind of stuff. That's, that's the area of my life that I need more accountability. Yeah. I pretty much just pay people to come exercise with me. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. That's what I do now. (laughs) Yeah. Like right now I have a boxing trainer who comes to my house twice a week. (laughs) Yeah. They're they're like, Oh, did you go to the gym? I'm like, I don't go to the gym. That's why I pay you. (laughs) Like, if I was a person who could just join a gym and go to the gym, I would do that. It's a lot cheaper. <laughs> However, I don't go, which is why you show up here twice a week to make me exercise. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, And you yeah. can do this with school. I mean, I have friends who are professors, and they actually have a private Facebook group. And they literally, like, announce when they're going to start working and when they're going to stop working. And if other people happen to see it because they're procrastinating on Facebook, um, <laughs> You know, they'll cheer them on and be like, yay. Or sometimes they'll be like, oh, you inspired me. Like, I'm going to start doing work now, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think that can be very helpful. I think it can, too. And I think, um, you know, you can even create accountability systems for yourself um, using even websites that allow you to give yourself money if you do certain tasks or give away money to organizations you don't want if you don't do certain tasks or meet certain goals. There are all sorts of software that you can download onto your computer to help you stay off the internet, um, <laughs> which I think, uh, or, or just block certain time waster websites like Facebook or Instagram or New York Times, or I don't know, I could go on and on and on about all the ways I, I can waste time on the internet. But, um, you know, I think Even things like Google Chat and turning off Google Chat so your friends in the library don't start talking to you. Whatever you can do to just take away some of the need to make decisions about wasting time. I think that for me, like I perform really well when I have strict rules. So it's like if I'm not allowed to check my email for the next hour or two, then that's easier than me starting to say like, oh, I should check my email. Oh, no, I shouldn't. Oh, but I might just do it quickly. Oh, whoa, I should respond to that. You know, I think it's almost like if I just don't have internet, I'm going to get more done. I think Gretchen Rubin has a whole theory about this. It's like some people can have a candy bar in their house and they'll have like a bite of it and it's no problem. Mm -hmm. Whereas other people like her, for example, she's like, if the candy bar is in my house, I know I'm going to eat all of it. (laughs) So I just have to have a hard and fast rule that there's never candy in the house. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, some people are the same. It's like some people, for whatever reason, can just like pop onto the internet and actually be there for five minutes. Other people could not. So just, you know. <laughs> I, think, I think most you of gotta, us cannot. It's yeah. You got to know yourself here. Yeah, exactly. Right? I mean, I know. I know. And, and I agree with you. I think most people are less disciplined about wasting time on the internet than they think they are. Yeah. So that makes me remember one of my favorite scenes in Sex in the City and all of the like, Seasons of Sex in the City, which is where Miranda, like, I think makes a cake or something like that and is only going to eat a couple bites of the cake. And then she, like, throws it in the trash can. But then oh, she yeah. goes into the trash can and starts eating out of the trash can. So she has to, like, put the dish soap on the cake so she won't eat the cake out of the trash can. I just thought that was so brilliantly honest. <laughs> it's true. And, I mean, I think that's worth thinking about. You know, like, if you are if you claim that you want to eat healthy food in law school, which is a very valiant thing to say that you want to do – you can't just expect that's going to happen. It's not like going to magically appear. Yeah, it's not like it's not like the fairy or the magic genie is going to come and deliver you healthy food when it's time for you to eat it. Like if that's something that you want to prioritize, 
you've got to think about how you're going to make that happen. Mm -hmm. And it might mean that you don't buy a bunch of crap. Right. It might. And when you're stressed, you know, if you have to, if you're one of those people that likes to eat chocolate when you're stressed, maybe it's not a good idea to keep a bunch of chocolate in your house. You know, it's yeah. Just- Whereas like with me and my roommates, we would order boxes of our personally selected C's candy for the exam period. And we would usually have some leftover at the end just because none of us had that personality where we were going to go at like midnight and eat all the chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> I will be honest, I could not keep a giant box of these candy in my house during, it would not last all of the final exam period. Yeah, like we would have like one piece if we were yeah. studying, you know, and like, but that's fine because we knew that we could do that. Right. <laughs> Everybody's got their own demons about things. So it's just about being honest with yourself. I think that's a lot of it is being self-aware. Well, and treating yourself with kindness. Yeah. I mean, there's something, like everybody does this. It's not like you're a terrible person because you ate all the chocolate. Right. It's just like, you know, you can reflect on this and be like, you know what? Next time, maybe I should buy like one bar instead of a whole case. <laughs> right, exactly. Because I know that eventually I'm going to go and eat all the chocolate. Yeah. And that's and that's totally that's totally fine. It's it's self awareness. It is kindness, and just setting yourself up for success. You know, what do you need to get to your goals? Probably one of the other self sabotaging behaviors we should talk about that we see all the time in law school is drinking. Oh yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. There are there are a lot of potential negative repercussions of excess drinking in law school. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's very common. I mean, people are under a lot of stress. The social conditions typically manifest as like, oh, let's go for a drink or let's, you know, there's just a lot of drinking in the culture. Mm-hmm. And particularly I was in school in New York, and so you've got like New York is a heavy drinking town. Law school is heavy drinking. Put those two together. And I was like, I have never seen people drink like this in my life. Like, you know, and I went to like some pretty hearty like party schools for an undergrad. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I was like, I've never seen people drink like this regularly. Yeah. Yeah. It can really be something you have to watch out for um, because if you're constantly hungover, you are also not going to be able to get your work done. (laughs) And then that's going to be definitely self-sabotaging behavior. And it could lead to all sorts of the substance abuse problems that happen uh, in the legal profession as a whole. So it's just something you just want to be aware. I mean, not saying don't go out to a bar night and have a good time, but when it becomes a crutch and prevents you from doing the things you need to do, it's probably worth taking a moment and examining what's going on. Yeah, like I had a friend, for example, at a different law school in New York his first year, and he later told me that he was basically spending every night reading his, you know, his cases in the library until about midnight, and then at midnight he would leave, but he would realize his brain was too wired to go to sleep, and so he would go by himself to this bar and, you know, order what was supposed to be like one drink to kind of calm him down, but he's like usually would turn into three or four and then it's two in the morning and I've been drinking for two hours and I was doing this every night. Yeah, that's something you may want to examine. Yeah, like, you know, whatever. I mean, he got through law school. There's no problem. But, you know, in retrospect, he was like, and I was also not telling anyone this because I kind of knew that it wasn't a great <laughs> idea. <laughs> you know, and he's like, yeah. I made sure I go to a bar where I wouldn't run into anyone that I knew. So, you know, it turns into all this, like, I'm hiding this. Mm-hmm. I know it's sort of a problem, but I'm not really dealing with it. Yeah. You know, I mean... Like I said, he survived, but he's like, you know, in retrospect, there probably were better ways to handle this feeling of like, there's so much stuff going on in my head that I can't sleep. Like, yep. maybe I should have like gone and listened to a guided meditation or something to like right. bring me down. Or stop studying earlier. Don't study till midnight so you can go to bed on time. Like, Yeah, I mean, yep. there are lots of options. Yeah. Other things I have definitely seen, um, I have seen students shut down and just binge watch TV shows for like oh, yeah. weekends. That's a or favorite. Weeks on end. That's a favorite. Um And, you know, okay, I like a good TV show too, but it's probably not a good time to binge watch Netflix while you have a lot of other work to be done. Now, again, if you can be disciplined, I think having a TV show or something like that that you look forward to watching to wind down after you finish all your studying can be fun. Um, Yeah, or like I would, for example, go at lunch and I'd have lunch in my apartment with my roommates and we'd watch two episodes of Sex and the City. Mm Mm-hmm. And then we did that every day. And it yeah. was just kind of like, oh, what do we, you know, if somebody missed it, it was like, oh, here's what you missed. You know, it, it was a social thing. Yeah. And it allowed us to like take a little time, like eat our lunch, chill out, and then go back to school. But, you know, if you're doing that seven hours a day, that's a different story. Yeah, exactly. During final exams, I would always pick um, some sort of a TV show that I hadn't seen. And of course, this is before, to make myself feel old, this is when you would get the like DVDs 
of the <laughs> TV shows. Uh, but I lived down the street from a rental, like a movie rental place. And so I would like pick up one of the DVDs. Of course, they had like four or five shows on it. But, you know, that was my reward for like studying all day. And then I got to like watch one or two episodes and I get to go to bed and the next day I get to watch a couple more. I mean, it can be, it can be something that you can reward yourself with. But when you're fi- studying for final exams, you probably shouldn't be watching, you know, six hours of Dexter uh, during the day, <laughs> which is what one student did that was working with me. She's like, I literally watched an entire season of Dexter this weekend. I'm like, I don't think that was the best use of your time, but now it's over. So we just have to move yeah, forward. Guilt, not productive. Let's <laughs> just figure out where to go from exactly, now. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And I think this idea of like a mini reward can be helpful. Um, I mean, I have a time management technique called the circles, which is kind of like the purest form of this, which is... You know, you kind of figure out what you need to do. You do an, a circle for each hour of work you're going to do on something. And then if you work for 50 minutes straight, you get to mark that circle off. So it's like this kind of really silly sounding reward of like, really, just because you get to like color in a circle, you're going to do it. But it's highly effective. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it can be all kinds of things. Like if I finish this K, finish the reading for this class, I'll go walk down the street and, you know, walk around the block or whatever. Or I'll call my friend and we'll talk for 10 minutes. You know, these, it doesn't have to be anything big or elaborate. Just the idea of having anything there that you're going to reward yourself with can really help with accountability. Oh, that's really true. You know, I'll take the dog on a walk, like mm-hmm. whatever it is. Yeah. Ideally, get some exercise, get out of the house, get out of your books. Yeah, for sure. I think another thing that can really happen to students is um, – just not taking care of yourself, so you end up probably getting sick. And I think that this is something that happens all the time. We were talking about trying to eat healthy food or not eating the entire box of chocolates. But, um, you know, if you're not sleeping or you're just eating pizza and you're not 18 anymore. And you're living <laughs> on like a continuous infusion drip of caffeine. Right. It's likely that once, you know, everyone goes home for the holidays and Thanksgiving, you're going to come back and everybody's going to get sick. <laughs> That's what's, you know, what seems. Well, and again, like getting sick can be this sort of self-fulfilling prophecy that gets you, lets you off the hook for not doing well. Right. You know, we talked to a lot of 2Ls and it's like, well, you know, what happened your first year? Well, things were going fine. And like, then I started to kind of fall behind and then I got really sick. Yeah. And it's like, okay, like things happen, but maybe do you think anything about your lifestyle was contributing to that? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and then it's like, you're just down a bad path. Like, oh, and then I couldn't take my exams and then this and then that and blah, blah, blah. It's just better to avoid that. It's just better to avoid that. And if you do get sick, come up with a plan of how you're going to take time off to get better and then try and triage the situation. I think where it can become a very slippery slope is it's like, well, then I got sick and then I got behind and then I failed my exam and then yada, yada, where it's like, I have worked with students who like had to have their appendix out, but then like took time off and got better and then came back and said, well, I'm just going to do the best I can. And then they still ended up doing okay because they tried to save it. You know, it's a lot of it is how you, come back from some of these frustrating situations of life that will happen. Um, Or if you're just looking for that excuse to say, well, now that I've got the flu, I'm just going to fail law school. (laughs) Yeah. And, you know, sometimes it's better to just take two or three days off if you are truly sick and get better than to, you know, the other thing people do is they just like, oh, I kept dragging myself to class and then I was taking even longer to do the reading and I wasn't getting any sleep. So I was sick for like a month. Yeah. And it's like, good Lord, just go to bed. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I think that that is definitely, definitely true. I think it's also important to note um, that if stuff really gets extreme, you know, you're not sleeping, you're, you know, participating in some serious self-sabotaging behavior that maybe is affecting your health or affecting your mood or affecting how your relationships with other people, it might be time to go ahead and seek out some professional support to try and fix this stuff. Because you, you know, we've talked about in the podcast before that depression and anxiety and things like that in law school can really, really get ratcheted up quickly. And um, if you're starting to get a little worried about yourself or you feel like you just cannot overcome some of these things, then it's time to reach out for some additional assistance. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I was depressed my second, beginning of my second semester of my first year, and I just literally stopped going to class. Like, I wasn't doing the reading. I wasn't going to class. I just was like, I can't get out of bed. 
Yeah. And granted, this was New York in January, and it was like five degrees outside, so it was kind of understandable. <laughs> yeah, but in some way, I was like, okay, this does not seem like something that is going to be a good thing for me. Yeah. Like, why don't I deal with it? Yeah. And, you know, I went and I got a therapist from the Student Health Center, and she was awesome. And, but, you know, it was really the better part of the semester before I was like, okay, I feel like I can cope with life again and actually, Mm -hmm. like, you know, try to get my shit together. I remember at some point she kind of looked at me and she's like, do you really think it makes sense to flunk all of your classes just to prove a point? (laughs) And I was like, yeah, I guess probably not. And this was like literally a few weeks before exams. Like, she was literally like, if you don't get it together, you're going to fail all of your classes. Yeah. And it was this moment of like, okay. And she was like, you know, you, she's like, you can do that or you can take leave. Like, you know, nobody's telling you not to, but you have to make a choice. Like, are you going to try to pull this together or not? And if not, like, go withdraw from classes. And I think that's a really interesting point because so often I think there are those decision points. You know, are you going to go all in or are you going to just, you know, cut your losses or, or truly just sabotage yourself to make sure that you aren't successful. And yeah. I think we see that in varying degrees with students all the time. I, mean, okay. I remember talking to students who had trouble writing under time pressure. And I said, okay, well, I want you to do this practice exam and I want you to stop at 60 minutes. And he sent it back to me and he said, well, I couldn't stop. And I was like, <laughs> I, I was like, I say this with love and support, but you couldn't take your fingers off the, <laughs> off the keyboard. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, like, what do you mean? <laughs> like you You're like, stop. That, that's actually just not true. Right. But, you know, it's interesting how we can really convince ourselves of very extreme things when we're, you know, when we're stressed and we're in, in negative places. And and I think sometimes talking to somebody else, whether it be a therapist or a tutor or a professor or a mentor, to kind of talk out some of this stuff so you can almost hear how silly it might sound to say, I could not stop writing. <laughs> When I'm like, yes, you could, you know, but he just really felt like that was his reality that he was living in. And and so if that is you, if you are living in a reality where you really feel like you're kind of, you know, in a place where you like can't remove your fingers from the keyboard, then I think it is a good idea to talk to somebody about it. Yeah, because I mean, part of this is like if you're really in this like extreme self-sabotaging place, it can be the sign that you're not on the right path. Yeah. That you have not come to a point where you can consciously admit that. Yeah. And, you know, I think a lot of people are under pressure from various directions, you know, to go to law school, to stay in law school. But at some point, ultimately, it's your choice to be there. No one's forcing you. I mean, even if your parents are telling you they're going to withdraw money from your funding, you know, they're not going to pay for your life if you drop out, you still have a choice. Yeah. You know, you can basically go to them and say, like, look, with all respect, I'm going to do what I want. Yeah. You know, like, this is not the right place for me to be. And I would rather work as a barista than stay in law school. And you're an adult. Yeah, you're grown up. You're you grown can do up. that. You can do that. <laughs> yeah, so like this might be a sign that like law school is not for you. It might not be. You know, there may be other things going on and you can deal with those other things. But just, you know, allow, a a po- allow the possibility that maybe this is your id talking to you in a way that you're not getting. Yeah. Because eventually this sort of thing, if that's the case, it just tends to get worse and worse. I think that's very Until very suddenly like you're having a physical breakdown because you can't handle the stress and the pressure of doing something that's so fundamentally wrong for you. And that's just not a great place to end up in. No. So don't do that, please. Yeah, don't do that. <laughs> well, unfortunately, with that, we are on that uplifting note, we are out of time. <laughs> if you enjoyed this episode of the Law School Toolbox podcast, please take a second to leave a review and rating on iTunes because we'd really appreciate it. And be sure to subscribe so you don't miss anything. Typically, our new episodes are on Monday. If you have any questions or comments, please don't hesitate to reach out to me or to Lee at Allison at Law School Toolbox or Lee at LawSchoolToolbox.com. And you can always contact us via our website contact form at LawSchoolToolbox.com. Thanks for listening. We'll talk soon and good luck with your accountability.